if any of you have ever tried to sync the Bitcoin or Ethereum blockchain, you might find it takes quite a lot of time. This is because you have to start all the way at the first block, download the next block, verify it, uh, and so on for, for millions of blocks. And they carry the accumulation of literally years of transactions and state changes. So it's quite a lot of work to do. And our research right now is how can we improve this? How can we come up with a, a lighter client which skips a lot of this work without compromising security? Uh, so first of all, what is a light client? And the terminology here is a bit jumbled. So uh, there's full nodes, there's light nodes, there's light wallets, and a lot of people aren't clear on exactly what all these terms mean. Uh, so some of you might have used something called a, a light wallet. This usually is a, a web app or some kind of GUI on your computer which connects to a third party service and gets data from them. Uh, and it's, it'll be a very smooth experience, but it's actually not particularly secure because it's very easy for that third party service or a man in the middle to subvert your connection and send you fake data, thereby causing you to send bad transactions, uh, maybe send your money to the wrong person or, or uh, who knows what. So we really want to avoid that. So what I'll be talking about here with a light client is how we can do as little verification as possible to remain secure, uh, but still be fully capable of interacting with decentralized apps or dApps. Uh, and to, to use the Ethereum network. And in particular, I'll be focusing on Ethereum, which employs Turing complete transactions, because this poses a unique challenge over something uh, less complex like Bitcoin, where you can get away with far less work. So, uh, Tomek describes a bit, good explanation by the way, uh, what Ethereum is. So this is this is the state of Ethereum. This is the state that everybody's trying to come to agreement on. This is what the consensus is over, because there's, there's two parts to a blockchain. There's the consensus, which lets everybody come to agreement, and there's the state, which everybody comes to agreement over. So this is Ethereum blocks, uh, and the state hangs off of here, and it's in something called a Merkle tree. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it it's, it's a regular tree data structure, uh, like a radix tree, not a binary tree, uh, where the key value pairs are actually the labeled path along the tree. And instead of pointing to nodes via regular pointers, we point to them with the hash. And what this lets us do is that the root of the tree is essentially the accumulation of all of the data encompassed in the tree. Uh, so that makes it very, very hard to spoof a tree or make a fake state and trick somebody. It also lets us prove a branch or a traversal of the tree. So here's the main tree. Uh, what we have hanging off of here are accounts. That is an account. It's got a nonce, it's got a balance. Uh, don't worry about the nonce right now. It's got the code hash, which is for smart contract code. And it's got another Merkle tree hanging off of it, which is the contract storage. Uh, so you can see that the accounts in Ethereum themselves can have arbitrary storage. When you execute a contract, this Turing complete code, uh, you might find yourself looking up some of this storage and then doing some computations and then jumping to other parts of the state tree and executing other contract calls. Uh, it's unpredictable exactly where you'll go, which is why it's such a challenge to make a good light line. Uh, I'll talk a bit about verification. So what is full versus partial verification? So when you synchronize the blockchain, uh, as you walk through the blocks, you verify the proof of work consensus, which Tomek described. Essentially, the solution to difficult puzzles, one for each block, uh, they get more or less difficult as needed in order to keep the block time roughly constant. So if we just verify the proof of work, it makes it slightly easier for someone to sneak in an invalid state transition. Uh, so it's a very, very small attack vector there. Uh, but full verification is if we verify the proof of work and also verify the state transition accompanied by it. Partial verification is if we just verify that proof of work. And basically, it's good enough. So we say, there is a lot of work being put into this network to produce new blocks. Let's just trust it. 
let's say that the state transitions are correct. And it basically always is, but it is something to consider. If you're very security conscious, maybe it's not the right thing for you. Uh, so here are the challenges and goals of the face. Uh, as I mentioned before, Ethereum transactions are Turing complete. Uh, the data that we might need to fetch is unpredictable. We want to remain secure against something called a Sybil attack, uh, which is where people will feed you false data. Uh, you might have several peer connections, 25 is, is the default, uh, in parity at least. And maybe the majority of these peers are actually malicious. But even so, you don't want to trust garbage data that they're sending. Uh, and we also want to have efficiency and performance and network usage. We want it to feel fast, we want it to feel responsive, we also don't want it to use all of your data cap. So what we've come up with is something we're calling PIP. Uh, not to be confused with the Python package manager, uh, but it's the parity light protocol. So all the responses to requests that we have here well, okay, Marek's making a face, but it's the parity lot I <laughs> protocol. <laughs> just to, just to it's a lowercase l, isn't it? Yeah, well, uh, I should have done the capitalization correctly. <laughs> uh, ignore that for now. Uh, so, all responses will be fully verifiable. Uh, one thing we can do is we can request fraud proofs of transaction execution. So instead of getting stuck in this weird loop where we want to execute a contract and then jump over the state tree wherever it sends us unpredictably, uh, for example, this contract looks up some item in its storage and then calls another contract which does this and does that and it goes all over the place. We have no idea what we need to fetch until it's actually time to go fetch it and we ton do tons of round trips. So we sidestep that whole problem and we just ask our peers to send us a proof of the transaction's execution, uh, which is the exact subset of the state necessary to fully execute this transaction. It's actually really easy to verify. Uh, there's also a system called request credits, which allows us easy integration with micropayment systems. Uh, although it's not actually implemented directly with micropayments, this gives us the flexibility to switch in and out systems as we prefer. Uh, and what request credits basically say is like, uh, it'll cost you this much of this arbitrary credits to make this request and this much for that request. And we can map these credits to physical value of, of some kind or just give them out over time. It's up to the server. Uh, and lastly, we have multi-type requests. So in the same packet, we can put a request for a header uh, for some kind of state proof, uh, a Merkle proof of that state tree. Uh, for a transaction execution, it can all go in the same packet. This lets us minimize round trips to the network. Uh, so what exactly is a fraud proof? I gave a sentence earlier, but maybe a little diagram will help explain it a bit better. Uh, you can imagine that this circle, this circle here uh, of the state tree is exactly what we need to execute some transaction. So we first ask our peer, hey, execute this transaction for me. Then they execute it, they find this is the exact subset of the state that we need. They bundle that up, send it to you, and you re-execute using that subset. And you've checked the proof, you've checked the transaction, all as well. So, we did a little test uh, where we calculated the proofs not just of the transactions, but actually the full state proof for each block, for the first three million blocks of the Ethereum mainnet. Uh, so we can see that actually these are, are <coughs> pretty decent size. Uh, in general, a couple hundred kilobytes. There are these strange spikes here, uh, which those of you familiar with Ethereum might recognize as the DOS attacks. Uh, actually, these go all the way up to 33 megabytes. So it is something to watch out for. And the first spike, is it the DAO? I don't know what the first spike is, actually. <laughs> it's, it's, not, it's not the DAO, strangely enough. Okay. Uh, but a more interesting metric, slightly more interesting, is block proof size as a ratio to gas used. So what gas is, just to take a step back, it's the unit of execution in Ethereum. So if you execute a transaction which has to do uh, some heavy computation, you have to pay a relatively or comparatively high amount of gas, uh, which is paid in Ether. Uh, 
uh, it's paid in currency. So you pay a little bit for every little bit of computation that you do. If you want to do more computation, you pay a bit more. So this is how much of the state do we have to access for every unit of computation that we do. And you can see that it's increasing over time. This is because the, the state as a whole increases over time. Uh, again, here's the state clearing and DOS attacks. Uh, so we're also focusing a bit not just on light points, but how we can make the full nodes that validate everything lighter. So we employ something called state pruning, which is where uh, we throw away old states that we don't need anymore. Uh, but furthermore, we can actually throw away old blocks that we need anymore. And there's a scheme to do this that we've integrated with the Parity Light protocol. So the idea is that every node has a unique identifier. Uh, and hmm, I might just skip this part, it's very technical. <laughs> So how light can we go for light nodes? Uh, we can actually discard basically every block uh, that we encounter on a light node, lowering our resource footprint almost to nothing. And we do this through something called a canonical hash tree. So this is a Merkle tree, which is produced once every 2048 blocks. It encompasses that range of 2048 blocks. And each one stores a mapping from block number to block hash. Uh, once we've created that tree on the light node, we can actually throw those blocks away. And then we can always ask our peers, uh, give me a proof from this canonical hash tree of what the hash for block number 500 was. And then if they return a proof that contains the same Merkle root as we have, uh, we know that that was the, the correct block. So we can discard everything but the root of this tree. So for every 2048 blocks, and I'll give, I'll give a, a, an example here in a moment to help you visualize. Uh, but for every batch of 2048 blocks, we can actually condense that down just to a 32 byte hash. So instead of the megabytes of blocks, we store simply 32 bytes of a hash. Uh, and it's cryptographically secure. It can't be spoofed. Uh, it's pretty useful. So, uh, for example, you can imagine we've got this mapping for a canonical hash tree. Uh, I used size 4 here instead of size 2048 for simplicity. Uh, but so we have the first block had this hash, the second block had that hash, the third block had that hash, and, and so on. Uh, and we, we turn this all into the Merkle tree that I described before. And then we just simply throw away everything but the root node of that tree. And we can ask our peers, give me a proof of that, of block one. And they'll return you some Merkle proof. You can compare whether the root of that Merkle proof is the same as the root hash of this canonical hash tree. And if so, then you know that you've successfully recovered the hash of that block. And this is, uh, this hash of the block also correlates with the state at that block, and it lets you do a wide variety of things. Uh, so here's the, the roadmap for the Parity Light Uh We're doing the implementation over at our GitHub repository. So we're doing the implementation and internal testing right now. It'll be done late this month or early next month, uh, at least ready enough to start moving into a public beta. Uh, where people can use it, they can test it, they can see how it works with the, the decentralized applications that they're developing. Uh, that will be in late April or early May. And then we're going to move on to trying to get uh, this built for mobile and as a mobile library so that people can integrate the light client into mobile decentralized applications. Any questions? I do apologize if that was a bit technical.